Okay, perfect. So this is a document that we are going to be using to uh, for um, taking notes. I'm just going to quickly take you through the document. Uh, I can see that people have been adding their names uh, and contact details, which is great. Thank you very much, uh, because we might contact you uh, to potentially be collaborators on a, on a, a blog. We might decide to turn notes from this session into a blog post, and then um, we'll invite you all elaborate um, on it. So uh, if you scroll down a bit below, there is an agenda for uh, today, so we've already shared the working document with everyone um, recording. We are making sure that we are recording the session and now we are going to go through a round of um, introductions um, and then I'll talk a bit about uh, communities of practice, but not for too long because I want to allow as much time as possible for, for the group discussion. Okay, so I'm going to ask you now uh, to just briefly introduce yourselves to the group and uh, I'll just ask you in the order that I see you. So, um, can we have uh, Leo first, please? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Leo. I'm a lecturer at the University of Liverpool. Uh, I work primarily in geophysics, but I do a lot of numerical modeling. Um, so there's always been a lot of software development involved. Um, so I'm involved mostly on the uh, uh, domain-specific software development uh, communities. Okay, thank you. Mateusz, next please. Yes, finding unmute button. Uh, Mateusz Kuzak, uh, I'm a community manager at the Netherlands eScience Center uh, and I'm also in, in, and I'm training coordinator in the eScience Center. I'm involved in uh, the NLRSC community and the training uh, community in the Netherlands. Okay, thank you. Um, can we have Esther next, please? Yes, hello. I'm Esther Asaf. I'm working at Freie Universität Berlin. So I'm from Berlin, Germany, and I'm in the position of a research data manager there at the university library. So I'm um, contacted by all the people of the university, so researchers, uh, students, and so on, if they have questions uh, with research data. Um, yes. Excellent. Thank you. And did I just stop sharing my screen? Well, that's strange. Yes, I think so. Okay, yes, let me try again. I have not touched anything. <laughs> anyway, so I can see Malvika next on my um, on my screen, please. Hi everyone, I'm Malvika. I am a community manager at the Turing Way and I'm also an SSI fellow. Okay, thank you. And then Emma, please. Hi, uh, I'm Emma. Oh, we are we are losing Emma, or is it just me? Yeah, we uh, involved in. Is that any better? Do you want to do you want to start from, yeah, sure. from the beginning? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I've got a message saying my internet is unstable, but that doesn't happen very often. I'll just check it. So my name's Emma. I'm a lecturer in the biology department at the University of York. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, so I'm really involved in getting people on the first step of their journey to doing things reproducibly and sustainably by sort of teaching coding to beginners or reluctant coders. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, and then I've got Emily next, please. Hi, um, I'm a research associate in digital humanities at Loughborough University uh, and I work with a lot of digital methods in history and literature uh, and I'm a 2020 SSI fellow as well. Thank you very much. Um, Tanya, please. 
Hi, my name is Tanya Allard. I'm based in the UK and I'm a developer advocate for Microsoft specializing in research and scientific computing. Thank you. Uh, I can see Rachel next. Hello. Um, hopefully folks know me, but I'm a community manager at the Software Sustainability Institute and also a 2019 fellow. And yeah. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Joe, please. Hi, I'll turn my camera on momentarily so you know what I look like. Oh, I've got a Yay, there I am. Um, I'm going to turn it off soon because the network's not good. Um, I'm an RSE at the University of Leeds in the School of Computing. I'm funded, well, I got a fellowship from EPSRC, um, which I think is quite difficult doing an academic RSE, but that's a different story. And I'm interested in this, this talk, this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, did I miss anyone? Because, because people, people's um, pictures jumped up and down in my gallery view, so I don't know if I've missed anyone. If I have, apologies, and now is the time to, to speak up. Okay, that, looks like... Hi, I just joined. Did I? I'm sorry, I'm late. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Emily. Emily Lewis, oh. this is second oh. Emily. Yes. Are we introducing ourselves? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Emily. I work for the Rutherford Afton Laboratory in their scientific computing department. Um, and I'm interested in building community to spread um, software sustainability best practices amongst all of the, the engineers and scientists that I work with. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to paste once again link to the shared notes document that we can all use to, to put notes and questions in. And for, for people who have joined us now, at the beginning of the document, we have a list of participants. So if you can just add your name and uh, contact details and affiliation or anything that you feel comfortable sharing with us, uh, just in case we, we need to get in touch with you um, to maybe turn these notes into a, a blog post and put you all as collaborators. Okay, so just moving moving on with, with the agenda. Uh, we've done the introductions and um, I'll just quickly try to um, give some 10 simple rules for running and growing um, communities of practice successfully, some, something that, that um, came up from, from SSI experience and involvement with, with various uh, COPs in the past. So I'll just switch over to, to my slides and go into the presenter mode. So the SSI has been involved in several communities of practice in the past, most notably with the research software engineers, which are now uh, turned into an association and quite self-sustainable um, an independent community of practice, uh, the carpentries as well, um, and also um, SSI fellows that we are still very much um, engaging uh, with at the moment. So um, in terms of 10 simple rules, um, just before before we go through these rules, I just want to, to, to uh, give a disclaimer. So basically, these rules are, have been collected or we've started a conversation about, about uh, these 10 simple rules at the SSI Open Fellows meeting last year uh, in November. And we, uh, we were planning to turn these into a 10 simple rules paper and we're hoping to have at least a preprint for uh, in time for collabor collaborations workshop. But, it has not happened yet. So here are some, some thoughts uh, from that meeting in no particular order, and this is still very much work in progress. Uh, so um, just to uh, warn you in advance. Um, so basically the, the first rule is to have 
a clearly defined purpose of the community of practice. So you, a community of practice has to be problem focused and it's about standardization of, of groups that are doing or producing something and normalization of culture. So basically it's about the process through which ideas and behaviors come to be regarded as normal or as standard uh, through um, collaboration within the community of practice. So the second, the second rule would be to have agreed rules of community behavior, interaction and participation. So uh, one of the first thing that a uh, community of practice needs to have is a code of conduct um, and other clear guidance about how people can participate, how they can contribute to the work of the, and activities of the uh, community of practice. And also, uh, have to pay attention to um, and have to understand global and cultural differences of people who are um, members of the community of practice. Um, perhaps related to the previous rule, um, you have to have um, clearly defined rules of, of communication. So you have to have um, um, standard policies um, on how communion uh, happen within a community of practice. So for example, whether you're going to communicate over mailing lists or over community calls, but also you, you should be mindful about the choice of tools for communication and how, also how they impose certain behaviors and culture. The next thing you have to think about is community tools and infrastructure. So uh, basically infrastructure that you're going to be using for creating resources as well as communicating. So perhaps slightly related to uh, uh, the communication rule. So basically you have to give the community uh, members a platform to express themselves within clearly defined rules of communication and conduct. So no single um, platform uh, or social media uh, will suit everyone. So when, when choosing your tools, you can make sure that information is shared on all of them uh, to make sure that you uh, are able to communicate with, with all the members of the community. Uh, so some people are more comfortable with using Slack. You, uh, some people are more comfortable with re reading newsletters that come perhaps once a week. Uh, some people are more comfortable communicating via mailing lists or community calls. So basically, uh, we have to be mindful of, of the choice of tools and infrastructure and how they impose certain behaviors and culture within the community of practice. Um, the next rule would be to make time to build, promote, engage and, and grow your community of practice. So you have to think about your community engagement strategies um, and before that, you have to identify what your key groups um, are in the community and also who are your most engaged and least engaged um, members and the ways how, how you can uh, interact with them. Uh, this is also about making sure that uh, everyone is receiving information that matters to them, uh, that core members are being rewarded and that also less involved members are encouraged to, uh, to be involved and contribute and partic participate in community activities. Try to be open and accepting of, of new members. Um, so perhaps this is about encouraging younger or early career people to attend your events or to get involved in your activities. Uh, invite them to run a workshop at your event. Um, create guidelines for newcomers. Make sure to, to help them to navigate the community and to participate in the events. Also think about running smaller and local events to, stre to strength, strengthen and grow local communities as well as running bigger all hand events where uh, the whole community can, can come together. Um, the next rule would be to have processes for people to uh, join, leave and take a break from, from the community. So, uh, First of all, you, you, you need to think about having some more onboarding processes for people to join. 
the community, but also allow people to take time out from the community, perhaps in a form of sabbatical, where with with some onboarding when they when they return. have correct incentives for, for the community. So show appreciation for people, learn how to delegate and give ownership of tasks to the others, uh, reward your participants. I think someone called this rule um, biscuits and stickers. So think about small things that, uh, that can motivate your community, but also you need to make sure that you can fund these little, little things. Consider paying people who are doing important work or lots of work and also value all types of contributions, however large or small, technical or non-technical um, expert um, and a novice. So you also have to create some communal or useful resources and this is linked to the uh, first rule that your community or practice has to have a, a, a purpose. So if you're not, if you're not creating some communal and useful resources that are used by, by all your community members, then perhaps you, you might not be a community of practice. Uh, being, being the right size. Uh, so this is about thinking uh, of having organizational um, structure of the appropriate size. Uh, to think about whether it's time to split into sub-communities and give, give certain tasks to these sub-communities. But also, uh, we did not really um, come with an answer how you can judge uh, whether you're the right size um, or not. So perhaps this is something that uh, uh, you, have, you might have ideas um, on. Uh, finally, make, um, make time to, to do um, health checks and do reg regu regular reviews of your community of practice. So sometimes you can do this on a small uh, scale and almost daily. Just ask yourself, who isn't in the room? Uh, is someone overrepresented? Is someone underrepresented? Are you uh, over-reliant on certain type of labor, for example, voluntary? Um, uh, are your activities likely to marginalize or exclude certain groups, for example, uh, people who with caring responsibilities perhaps may not be able to, to work um, certain hours. Think about the bus factor as well for, for your key activities. Um, also, uh, reevaluate uh, your impact and whether it's in, still in line with your mission. Think about your growth. Are you growing at a sustainable rate? Is the community growing at all? Um, what are the overheads for joining the community? Um, are you still fulfilling the needs of the community? Also think about the business model, uh, your ongoing funding, whether you can attract some new funding and what are the avenues for that? And finally, um, know when to stop or to refresh or to regroup your um, community of practice. Okay, so that's briefly uh, what what I had to to say, and then sorry, long time looking looking at uh, so we can now spend some time on on questions and answers. So we in the document we have a section here for questions, so you can feel free to put put your questions in, and then some of the questions we can probably. I can probably try and answer now. Some of the questions perhaps might be a bit, uh, might be more important and we can add them to the group discussion that will happen uh, after. And then we can attack those questions as a group. And then if there are some questions that perhaps are uh, outside of the scope of this mini workshop, we can feed them back to the Software Sustainability Institute and then uh, uh, then we can try try and think about those questions as well later on. So if you want to spend a couple of minutes just adding your questions and we'll look at them. 
and also if you want to ask any questions about, about what we've covered so far. Oh, quite a quite a, a few questions popping up.
Okay, so are people still typing? I can see some, some um, class on certain. I also see that people people are also clustering questions themselves. Um, so I think there were there were two questions about about inclusivity. So there was the, the women in HPC use monitoring and intervention to monitor and improve inclusivity. Have you suggestions on how to monitor your community? If you're missing a group, how do you know they are missing out? And then there was a question about, um, uh, or maybe it's uh, gone I now. I merged them, so. Uh, oh, did you? Okay, yeah. perfect. <laughs> I, I think, I think, these all, all questions are brilliant and we should probably include them maybe and try and answer them as a group. Uh, so for example, how do you reach new audiences? We're establishing um, a new community of practice. And then uh, advice for people establishing completely new uh, communities of community of practice. Uh, so let's have a look uh, at the questions that I had here. Uh, I wanted uh, us to answer as a group in, in a few bullet points. Um, so, uh, how do you select communities of practice that you get involved in? What good practices have you seen in communities of practice? What resources and support do communities of practice need to develop further? And what can we learn from other organizations that support communities of practice? So, I can add some questions here and then we can try and, and um, attack them. So how about I copy this one? Um, and then the question about me as well. So we we are looking for answers uh, as, as well as, as you are. So hopefully we can, as a group, um, get them together. Um, can you discuss a bit more on defining a structure for people to involve, take a break and leave your community? Something important for people who are prone to burnout. As somewhat related, how to engage members of your community without always leaning on the same people. Okay which can lead to burnout, how to get more folks engaged so the duties are spread out. For example, the same people aren't always getting asked volunteering to do, to do things. Um, so I can, I can try and answer this, this one now and then see if anyone else can, um, can add uh, to this question. Uh, so from my experience with the carpentries, they've started implementing um, taking sabbatical from instructor training and other teaching uh, teaching duties. Let me just, I'll just stop sharing my, my screen so I can see all of you better. So they've basically, they've asked people to sign up if they want to take a break from the community. And uh, they ask, uh, they, they suggested people take a break for one year and then and then come back after that or take um, another another year off so um, and then they've um, I believe this they, they somehow maintain uh, the list of people who are trying to who, who are taking um, leave and they're not being asked uh, to volunteer their time to uh, run workshops or to help or to run community calls um, so uh, I don't know if anyone else has had um, other experiences that they can share. About taking taking break from from. Um, has anyone taken a break from a community? I feel like the problem with a lot of people in this room is that none of us know how to take a break from the community. <laughs> I, I took a break from uh, a lot of my roles in the carpentries because before they hadn't devised how to stop people from burning out. And we a lot of people who were working around me at the time were working so much that all of them burned out and slowly they retreated. And the danger is that you don't want people to completely retreat. You want them to 
feel secure and come back. And that's something um, I struggle with. I think that's important as well because people might drop out from, from activities naturally. So preempting that and giving them a chance to officially take a break rather than uh, stop stop doing things and then and then feeling guilty or bad about it. Um, so just preemptively right. offer, offer them. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Batesh. No, so I was wondering if there's a way to somehow uh, may, like normalize people quitting the project, or like leaving the projects, so that uh, how how can we make it? Uh, less of a stigma or uh, yeah uh, m less of a pressure or um, there is a natural thing that happens yeah that that people uh, do it I don't know uh, oh. because I think even even if like uh, people will always uh, I think <laughs> have feel bad about it yeah so how how can we make them feel good about it I think there's a second issue which is when you have people who are doing everything then other people don't circulate in and learn the skills. So in that case, if you have enough people, you could maybe have rules saying that you take on a role for a year and then you have to have at least a gap or two years or however long you think that that stability needs to be. Um, you could put those in place. I know charities have that for their trustees. So that, that works there. And secondly, I took a career break, which is a bit more severe than just taking a stop. And it was very difficult getting back into it. And so making sure that you leave the door open for people to come back, I think is quite important. Yes, I feel maybe maybe some of us feel feel difficult to to leave things, but then, as you said, Joe, if you leave the door open and then know you can you can come back um, and that you're not completely excluded. But also, I think the com I think we talked uh, I, th I think I talked in my slides about making sure that there is an onboarding procedure, well, a re onboarding procedure to to bring the members who are coming back um, up to speed. With the latest developments? Sure, I think there's an issue in our area or the area of RSEs, which is it's a, not a fully recognised career. So in some ways, unless you have a permanent role in a, in a service group, um, you've got the double pressure. You're trying to keep up to date with what all the academics side of it and get publications but you're also looking at your community, the RSE or software sustainability or whatever, and you're trying to meet their standards as well. So there's a lot of pressure, you know, on our types of communities in any case, which, and so you might be volunteering to, for career purposes, because it's so un insecure. Okay. Um, anyone else wants to do it, add anything on this question? I particularly like the way that you, the project Jupiter actually handles this. So when people are onboarded on Project Jupiter, they have three different tiers. Let's say one is the red team, then the other is blue team, no, blue team, red team, and green team. So they have the entry level that is when people are familiarizing with the workflow and with the project and they have like little responsibilities and then as they get more involved they can take up more responsibilities and they help others to onboard as well and then when people can no longer complete their tasks or they need a break or they want to be more on an advisory capacity rather than main contributor they move on to the green team but they're still considered part of of the team um, and i think that's that's very nice a very nice way to recognize those that have built up the project without them necessarily needing to be there Okay, thank you. So I'm just looking at the questions. So we started attacking, attacking the questions, some of the questions that you had, but also I, I moved some of them above to, to the top. Um, so I'm just going to copy the remaining questions as well in the group discussion session. 
and then um, so if you scroll up let me just share my screen for, again for a second and then because we have around 20 minutes maybe slightly less than that before before the end of the session uh, so shall we try and attack each of these questions and and try and, and maybe put some bullet points as answers how does that sound so this number seven actually before that i wanted to ask all of you uh quickly which which cops do you belong to so um got this all a bit backward i started answering the questions before before uh So if you can just put your name and list some COPs that you're involved in. That would be very interesting piece of information. Just a heads up, Alex, this ends in 10 minutes, I think, at 55. 55, okay. Not much time. But let's let's try and attack as many questions as, as we can. Uh, maybe we can prioritize some questions. So if you look at the questions under number seven, uh, see which ones you, uh, I can actually put numbers and put numbers let me see if we can prioritize it oh, no, which ones would you would you put at the top so we have 10 minutes or shall we try not waste um, time in prioritizing them and just attack. <laughs> Sorry, go yeah, go ahead, Esther. But I think um, how to reach new audience would be something okay. I would be interested in. How to reach new audience. Um, so e. e. Okay, put that at the top. Okay, any any other? Oops, I think I just messed that up. Oh, and maybe the um, inclusive with the inclusivity. Oh, the inclusivity. Because, uh, that was what many people asked. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, anyone else wants to uh, attack this, and I'll just try and type the bullet points in the document. So, how do you reach new audiences when establishing a new community of practice? Uh, and also any particular advice for people establishing completely new community of practice. I wonder about um, applying for funding, not big funding, um, but small funds like you get from various academic societies for launching events. Like the Biochemical Society is quite good at that. You can get £500 grants just to have a launch event, cover some funding for launching events. And they then also would tend to advertise it on their own networks. Networks. Yeah. Okay, so I put that under C, and then let's let's try and see if we can we can answer 
uh, some of these. I mean, it just even having questions is useful <laughs> if we don't get all the answers. Okay, so anyone else wants to, uh, to, to, to give some uh, give us some ideas how to reach to new audiences or how to start the new COP. Yeah, so I think you already mentioned that having different platforms is good. So having maybe a website, having a Twitter or having more than one, maybe people tweeting about it, um, maybe having a series of events where you can invite people who are interested in a topic uh, just to have a look at uh, what you are doing or what kind of topics you are tackling and um, invite them to work with you. Okay, so different platforms pub to publicize on different events to attract new audience. Anything else that people want to? They call it championing, don't they? Where you find someone important who when they find talk will give mention. Or will come and talk and encourage your group. So they always say someone like you. If you can get your VC to talk, I mean, you're probably not going to, but your head of school or someone to talk, just to show that it's it's something that's seen as good. Mm -hmm. So find champions. Okay, fantastic. If so, get a VC to talk if you can. <laughs> I think this one's related yeah <laughs> that's to but to attach to um some kind of existing organization or group like the white rose universities or the n8 universities that doesn't have a community of practice as such excellent how about starting a new one so that would be attached to an existing group is that right? So not not exist not an existing community practice group, but an existing entity organization. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that would be to uh, to reach new audience. So how about starting a new one? COP. I think Rachel has an experience with that with her her plus data if she's still on the call and uh, she had to leave she posted oh, up she, left. she has other things to do okay can I, yes can i add alex i have already written oh i'm getting weird now um so when you in in our case uh, the open life science when we were starting we just reached out to people in our network who we knew were practicing similar thing as we were interested in. So uh, giving, so what we did is sat down and wrote all the values that they can gain by being part of our community. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was not just uh, just like one way relationship. So I have, I have put like a note up there, start with your own network, reach out to the community who are similar mm -hmm. as you, uh, don't try to compete, but collaborate. Mm -hmm. It's the right value proposition, don't try to compete, to compete, but collaborate. Okay, fantastic. Shall we try and attack it on um, as well in the last couple of minutes at least? So uh, suggestions on how to monitor the diversity um, and improve, uh, sorry, inclusivity. That was, I think, a question from, from Joe. Anything on that, on that topic? And maybe finding a group that is already um, tackling the, so are just concerned about inclusivity and so on and ask them because at my university, I know there is a group who's already working like for gender uh, equality and so on and you could ask them maybe um, if they have any tips if you have sure. local groups for that already. I, I think the obvious one is to survey people but people get bored of that don't they so if you have an online meeting you could ask everyone 
to say, you know, what, what issues they have. Um, you could have a specialist group within your community to look at inclusivity. At the University of Leeds, we never managed to set up a women in HPC group in part because we couldn't monitor. Um, the systems were set up so we couldn't monitor women using HPC resources, training or anything else. Um, and we talk, I talked to Athena Swan and we weren't able to and that kind of squashed the ability to really join the uh, women in HPC as a chapter. Um, and they, the, the university said that the staff data wasn't structured in a way where they could supply us with that information. So, um, yeah, it's a difficult one. And inclusivity data, you know, in some countries, it's you could have a death sentence for being in gay or something. So it can be quite confidential as well. But it's just one of those things I'm always asking people if they <laughs> if they have any ideas or tools or anything so I, I, just I, feel, I agree with that because sometimes we live in our cultural bubble and don't don't think about things and then you get surprised and someone has to speak up and basically tell us um oh but i yeah, can't do is, this or i'm not comfortable with this so you have to ask people really so that's another thing you can do you can just make it um, very easy for people to speak up because I mean they do say that's one of the reasons you should aim for inclusivity because it makes the, your solutions more robust so if you want robust solutions make it easy for people to speak up maybe um, that's brilliant anyone anyone else Um, I'm just mindful of, of time. I think we actually have to have to stop, and I think we have a couple of minutes to um, to go back to the room, unless people maybe attack the third one quickly. Applying for funding for launching events. The one that Emma mentioned. A couple of bullet points. Um, does anyone know when, um, any funding body? So um, societies like the Biochemical Society or the Royal Society of Biology, I would know in my field. Um, and I guess there's other ones like that in other domains. I think this question we can definitely ask on Slack because mm. I know one funding body, you know when I'm sure there are people mm. who can add a bit more. How about we slowly trickle this question in Slack and ask more people? We to could. Ask. Alan, Turing, Alan Turing Institute had had a, a fund for events. Um, well, so. SSI is uh, giving fellowship, which yes, which is exactly. super good for me because I want to take a live workshop, and my my employers don't think maybe I'm not sure what if they don't think it's relevant but it's definitely relevant as my position as community manager and SSI will not question me which is great and so maybe the, is, sorry so go sorry I, I will add that I know a couple of them for example OBF uh, open bioinformatics foundation uh, they they promote new open source communities so you can ask for money and I think uh, we need to probably write recommendation or find a proper way to ask institutes to have low barrier funding for such efforts, which I think is super difficult. There was also Python Foundation and our, our foundation, they also have had um, funds for events. Sorry, Mateusz, you had a hand. Uh, yeah, so I was uh, wondering about that because we, um, so I'm uh, co-leading the NRSC uh, community and then we we have we get some money regularly from the Netherlands e science center we just do it under the umbrella of e science center but uh, I don't know if anyone has any experience if you actually want to apply for sponsorship I don't know from Microsoft or from someone else do you need to have a legal entity for that because the, for us it's like we're a very informal group in a way we're not uh, official society or foundation or non-profit organization and then uh, making it formal, it is a lot of effort and work. Uh, the question is, 
to, does anyone have experience with that? Like, is this necessary? Also, like, what, do you think it's worth spending time on or, mm, I don't know, <laughs> just throwing I, I can share one from the bio IT at Ample we were doing. Uh, we found it very difficult to access funding which is attached to an organization they would not give that funding to you without you having an invoice and the issue with that is then you would have to allow your participants or whoever is asking for money to have the invoice and therefore you need to find a way where the institute can pay for that directly instead of you handling the money because i think most of the organization don't like someone else taking a chunk of money without details it really limits you but i think it's the best way you can do with an institute okay thanks very much everyone sorry to have overrun a bit um, i know we have to get back to the main session now and malvika you might have been right maybe we need to, to turn this into a survey and then and then just send it out to the wider just community try it. one at a time <laughs> One question at a time, uh, yes, but um, at least we tried to, to tackle maybe the, the questions that were more important to you. Um, so thanks very much, everyone. And I'll, I'll think I'll see you soon all in, in, the, other, in the other room. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for joining. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.